The Hot Hatch. These little cars characterise fun on four wheels. If they're done right, they've got the ability to get right under your skin and turn you into a bit of a hooligan. It's a really basic formula. You take a family hatchback, and these days with their growing size, it's probably even gonna be a super mini. You get rid of that economy engine, and you stuff in as much engine as you can from further up the food chain. You upgrade the brakes, tweak the suspension, drop in some sport seats, and you send it out to the world to deliver loads of smiles per gallon. They should be exciting, playful, involving. Basically, they need to be fun with a capital F. They're so broad in their appeal that even the most prodigious car collectors tend to have not one, but a good few of these in their car collections. The French, well, they're connoisseurs in this car class, and Renault in particular have a real heritage at getting this right. This then is Renault's Clio RS, RS standing for Renault Sport. The flame red car that you just saw hot footing around Aspersion was the RS200, but this, this is the even hotter RS220 Trophy Cup Edition. Now for the power plant, Renault has moved away from the atmospheric 2 litre that powered the previous cars to success. This is the Nissan derived 1.6 inline 4, it's really similar to the one that we saw delivered in the Duke RS. It delivers 220 brake horsepower with 262 newton meters of torque. Shelling white weighs in 1200 kilograms, which means that this pocket rocket has got 180 brake horsepower per tonne. That's a standing start of 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds and a top speed of 146. Now, to colour some context, for the last few videos, we've been dealing with cars that have got nothing less than 500 brake horsepower. It wasn't that long ago that an RS Cosworth would ship with brake horsepower figures that started with a 2. So did the likes of things like sports cars like the Porsche Boxsters. The technical highlights then of the trophy model are revised springs, 20mm at the front and 10mm at the rear. It's got retuned dampers, the rear springs are 40% stiffer than on the 200 and the steering rack is actually faster by 10% and crucially there's Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s for an insane amount of grip. This car was limited to being available in only 5 door configuration with smartly integrated door handles that give this real believable perception of it being a 3 door car. But this car will be remembered for being the first of its kind that caused an upset, not for being a five door, not even for being turbocharged, but for the emission of that third pedal and the introduction of these paddles. So this introduction of a dual clutch transmission decidedly changes the dynamic of this car, making it one of the first hot hatches to feature this kind of F1 style gearbox, but potentially making it less pure, maybe less fun, potentially. So the real question that this little car has got to answer is, did it retain that award-winning, smile-inducing character? Well, let's hit the road first. As first and foremost, a hot hatch has got to deliver in its native environment, and that is the B Road. So the elephant in the room are these paddles, so let's talk about them because I think there's some pros and cons to them. The paddles are mounted to the wheel as opposed to being mounted to the steering column and in the real world that's actually a preference of mine. I think it's just if you're getting into a bit of a situation it's so much easier to find out where things are. Some people like to have the paddles fixed so that they know where they are all the time but I think if you're getting crossed up it's good to have them in this configuration. Um, a fun fact, these paddles are actually made or actually sourced from a Nissan R35 GTR and it's not the only thing that it borrows. The engine noises are piped in via the speakers so Renault thought that while they're at it they may as well give you some extra sound. So from this centre display console you can actually choose to have sounds from an Alpine like an A110 or a Guardini or even, yep you guessed it, a Nissan R35 GTR being pumped into your Renault Clio. Now paddles lead you to gearbox which it's not the snappiest of here. This isn't a reflection of the mod, this is how the car behaves. Uh, this is the 200 non-cup chassis car out on these back roads so hopefully in the cup car it will be just a bit more a bit more decisive. Um, the chassis does feel great here though. Uh, this combination of Potenza tyres and this tripod like platform is undoubtedly encouraging. Before you know it you're Scandinavian flicking the car around and you're handbraking around corners at pretty much any opportunity that you can. It 
does feel at home here. It makes you drive this car like it's the last car you was ever going to drive. So you could say, yeah, it's a hoot on a back road. So Germany, thank you for giving us that insight on your back roads. Uh, now it's time to find out what it's like on the track where undoubtedly the expectations are higher than they would be out here on a back road. This is Fife, Scotland, and more specifically the short but technical Knock Hill circuit. Its short nature makes it ideal for this sort of power level, not leaving the cars feeling too asthmatic on the straightaways. Now, we're not gonna be doing any lap times here. No, this is a qualitative test. So with the barometer being fun itself, the benchmark, it could be argued, is this car, the Toyota GT86. 200 brake horsepower, very similar weight, and a reputation for fun. But I think there are good enough front wheel drives out there that deliver just as much fun. And in fact, one of the Clio siblings would do just the trick. This is Renault's Megane RS275 Trophy R. And yes, this is the car that lapped the Nordschleife in less than eight minutes. And yes, it does have comparatively more power than the Clio. But this is all about fun. And this is one of those cars that delivers that kind of front wheel drive fun in absolute spades. So let's see what it's like. I think the distinctive characteristic that makes this car this much fun, that epitomizes the character that it has, is oversteer. Somehow, even with all of that grip that these Michelin Pilot Sports have got, you get to control the rear of the car with your right foot, and it's so compelling. The engine, it's a riot. Yes, it's up on power from the Clio, but it's not the amount of power that makes it an enthralling power unit. It's the fact that it's willing to let you rev it right out with really consistent power delivery all the way up the rev range. Is it playful? Yes. Is it involving? Definitely. Is it exciting? Yes. Is it fun? Absolutely. Absolutely. This definitely gives you a sense of what to look for. Now, let's jump into that Clio Cup Edition and let's find out what it's all about. Let's see if it can actually live up to that. It's the same levels of fun that the Megane delivers and obviously its own reputation. Well, straight out the box, the engine it is a bit lackluster at the top end. It rages all the way up to around about five grand and it just seems to fall short of the excitement that you get before you pull the paddle. The chassis, well, there's, there's a phenomenal amount of grip. There's loads of it. At times, I actually think there's a bit too much grip to be having fun. It's so focused and planted, it makes it excellent for pummeling around tracks with that inch perfect precision that you want to have on like a track day, but it never really feels like its personality is coming out that it might just surprise you with a cheeky bit of oversteer. The gearbox, obviously this is the contentious topic, the controversial bit. Now, there's no negative reflections on the mod created Derek here because the actual car behaves like this. You always feel like you're slightly incorrectly geared. Second feels a little bit too low, third feels just a touch too high, and certainly here at Knock Hill, it's just out of kink for how quickly you're actually going. Is it playful? Yeah. Is it involving? Yeah. Is it exciting? Sometimes. Is it fun? Yes, it is fun. There's a personality that comes out in that R275 Megane that you don't really get here in the RS220. That car feels a little bit spiky, like lift off oversteer could happen at any point and you don't get that in this. On reflection, I think the RS200 may have actually been a bit more fun to bring here. It's got a little bit less grip, it's a little bit less planted, sure it has a tiny bit less power, but I think it may actually have just a bit more character than its more established cup version. With the Megane being just as good as it was, it makes you wonder why Renault didn't just drop the Megane engine into the Clio chassis and maybe, and maybe, just maybe, make a limited run of manuals, you know? That would, be a, that would be a real hoot if they did. Well, if they did, it would actually look 
something like this. Well this is the Renault Clio RS16 and sadly some salty person over at Renault chose not to put this car into production. It features the 2 litre Renault engine from the Megane, so 271 brake horsepower and 265 pound foot. It also has the Megane's transmission with its limited slip diff. Front and rear tracks are increased by 60mm and the suspension is supplied from the gods over at Olin. Those wheels and tyres are also from the Megane. Lightweight speed lines again with Cup Sport 2s. Obviously it would be rude not to get a lap, so let's do just that. This is everything that the Clio needed to be. And to be honest, that's not just down to the gearbox. It's more engaging from an audio perspective, it's more involving in the chassis, there's enough power to unstick it, and even if it shipped with the dual clutch, it wouldn't have robbed the fun that this car delivers. So this is what is arguably the best Renault Clio ever made and it will never actually be made beyond being a concept. What a shame. Let's hope Renault get fully back on track with the next Clio. Until then, yes this is fun, just not as fun as we all expected it to be.